Okay, hi, so in this video we're going to go through three examples of electrolysis that you really need to know. So we're continuing with the electrolysis uh, topic. If you don't know the fundamentals of electrolysis, then please have a look at my previous two videos. Okay, so the first example we're going to have a look at is the electrolysis of brine. And brine is just salt water. And by salt, I mean table salt, so sodium chloride in water. Okay? Now you'll remember from part two on electrolysis that if we have something dissolved in water then this will actually affect what we're going to get at the positive and negative electrode and there are some rules that we can remember for what's going to be formed. And so let's have a look first at what is going to happen at the positive electrode. So at the positive electrode, now negative ions are going to be going towards the positive electrode and we have sodium chloride and the negative ion from that is the chloride ion. And apart from that, remember water will also form the hydroxide ion. And if you remember, we said that out of everything, halogen comes first, hydroxide comes second. So what we're actually going to form is chlorine. Chlorine, sorry, from chloride, because we do have a halogen. And then how about at the negative electrode? Well, at the negative electrode, we are going to um, attract positive ions. And our positive ions here are sodium plus from sodium chloride and hydrogen plus from water. And if you remember, I said that the compound that we're going to form, or not the compound, sorry, the substance that we're going to form is going to be the least reactive one. So sodium is an extremely reactive metal. Hydrogen is less reactive. So we're going to form hydrogen gas at the negative electrode. And then what does that leave us in solution? Well, that leaves us the sodium plus the hydroxide, which will therefore leave sodium hydroxide in solution, like so. Okay, so let's have a look at the apparatus that we use to carry out this, um, this electrolysis, because this happens in industry. So, this looks slightly different to ele the electrolysis that we usually see, and that's because this is on a really large scale. But... It really is quite simple. We have our positive electrode on the left and our negative electrode on the right. So that's similar to usual. And coming in this gap here, we have our sodium chloride solution. Okay, so sodium chloride comes in. So NaCl, and this is brine, so it's aqueous, is going in. Okay. Now one important thing I'll quickly label here is this membrane. This is a membrane, you may see it referred to as a diaphragm membrane or a porous membrane. Uh, and all this does is it stops the chlorine produced, remember we said we produce chlorine, it stops this from remixing with everything else that's produced. Because chlorine is reactive, and so chlorine could just mix with everything else and it will stop us actually separating anything. So this membrane stops that from happening. Now the positive electrode, as we said before, we produce chlorine, because from the chloride ions. And so chlorine will be produced, and chlorine is a gas. So chlorine, chlorine gas, leaves this way. So chlorine, gas. Perfect. Now we've got rid of some of the chlorine gas, the level of the sodium chloride will go down because a lot of the, um, a lot of the components of it have gone because chlorine has left. And because this membrane doesn't allow chlorine through, that's why we can see this difference in level. Now, what happens at the negative electrode? Well, at the negative electrode, remember, H plus will go to the negative electrode because sodium is more reactive than hydrogen. So the sodium will be happy, happy staying in solution. So hydrogen goes to the positive electrode. Hydrogen is, of course, a gas as well. So hydrogen here will leave as a gas. So here we have hydrogen gas. Perfect. And then what are we left with? Well, in solution, We've got rid of our hydrogen, we've got rid of our chlorine, and so now we have sodium and hydroxide. So NaOH in solution, so aqueous, will leave this way. And this is what happens in the electrolysis of brine on an industrial scale. Now if we want to write the half equations of what's going on at each electrode, the positive electrode, remember we're forming chlorine from chloride. 
So we have chloride, okay, and we are forming chlorine. Chlorine is Cl2. And so to get to chlorine, we've obviously had to remove an electron. So chlorine plus an electron. To balance this, we need two of these to make Cl2, and therefore we have released two electrons. At the negative electrode, we have H plus from our water is going to form hydrogen gas, and hydrogen gas is H2 as well. So we have H plus, but to get from plus to neutral, we have to add the electrons. The H plus plus electrons makes H2. And so therefore we need two of these plus two electrons. And if you want to write the state symbols, the ions are aqueous and both chlorine and hydrogen are gases, like so. Now this is an industrial process, so very quickly, why do we bother doing it? What's the use of chlorine, hydrogen and sodium hydroxide? Well chlorine is important because chlorine can make bleach, it's a component of bleach, obviously it cleans our water. So it's antibacterial. I'm just going to write antibac there. So clean water. Okay. And it's also found in some polymers. So some plastics and different polymers have chlorine in it as well. So chlorine is a very useful substance. Okay. Now how about our hydrogen? Well, the hydrogen produced in this way, because there, are, because there are only a few substances in here, and it's a very straightforward process, and using this membrane means that we don't get a lot of mixing around at all, this hydrogen is pure, and therefore we can use it to make hydrogenated um, compounds, in particular hydrogenated fats. So we could say hydrogenated fats. Obviously we know why this is a bad thing, but it's obviously still a massive part of in industry. Hydrogenated fats, such as margarine. Okay, and finally sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is also used to make bleach. So both chlorine and sodium hydroxide are used to make bleach, but it's also used in our soaps or to make our soaps and in the production of paper. So all three, chlorine, hydrogen and sodium hydroxide are very important substances for us to produce industrially. Okay, so now we'll move on to the extraction of aluminium. So here we're talking about the extraction of aluminium. And you know from your uh, Unit 1 course why aluminium is so useful to us. So this is actually going into how we extract it. Now we find aluminium in an ore. So aluminium ore. And that ore is known as bauxite. Bauxite. And it contains aluminium oxide, which is Al2. O3. And bauxite also contains various other compounds. Uh, one example is iron oxide. And so we need to separate the aluminium oxide from the rest. And so we must extract or separate this aluminium oxide. Okay, and that produces some waste material. So that's one step already, which is going to cost us some money. We then need to split this up. So we need to split up Al2O3 by electrolysis. Electrolysis. Now there's one massive issue with this. The melting point, so the melting point of aluminium oxide is over 2000 degrees. It's actually 2050 degrees Celsius. And so that would require massive amount of energy. So very high energy. And that is a problem because it's going to cost us a lot of money. And so we actually have found a way of, of reducing the amount of energy we need. And that's by dissolving. So we dissolve aluminium oxide in molten cryolite. Now I did mention this in the first unit, but you don't need to know this for the first unit. And cryolite is another compound that does contain aluminium. It's another ionic compound. But this melts, so the melting point of cryolite is 800, or around 850 degrees Celsius. And so that's under half the temperature needed to melt pure aluminium oxide. But aluminium oxide will dissolve in this molten cryolite. 
So that means we only have to reduce the, sorry, we only have to increase the temperature to 850 rather than 2050 degrees Celsius. And so this will save us a lot of energy. Okay, and so at the negative electrode, let's do it in a different color. At the negative electrode, what are we gonna form? Well, we have our positive ion, and that is aluminium. It's actually an aluminium three plus ion and that is going to form aluminium metal. The reason why we're not competing here uh, with hydrogen or H plus is because we haven't dissolved in water, we have dissolved in cryolite. And so we don't have our hydrogen and hydroxide problems like we do with an aqueous solution. Okay, and that makes things simple at the positive electrode as well. Our negative ion is going to be our oxide. So aluminium oxide, oxide is O2 minus. And that is gonna form oxygen, but oxygen gas is O2. And so we're going to need two of those. So if I was to balance these, um, I would add three electrons here. So three electrons cancels out this three plus, making it aluminium. O2, we need two of them to make O2. And that is going to be added to four electrons because each one of these has lost two electrons. So two electrons twice makes four electrons. Now, if we were to write out the full equation for what's going on here, we'd have to balance these as well, because in aluminium oxide, you've got two aluminiums and three oxygens. But you don't need to go into that, uh, luckily, for this example. This is just demonstrating what's happening at the electrodes. Okay, so let's have a look at the apparatus. Okay, so this is the sort of thing that you're going to see. Right, now this looks very different to your regular uh, electrolysis diagrams. These two electrodes are exactly the same thing. They are both your positive electrodes. And this here is your negative electrode. And it lines, as you can see, the entire, um, the entire cell. So this is the negative electrode. Negative electrode. Now the reason I've done them in the same color is that both electrodes, so both electrodes are made of carbon. The reason they're made of carbon is because this reaction is, ha is happening on a massive scale. Carbon is cheap for us to produce and it is also less reactive than aluminium. And so we only need something that's less reactive than what we are uh, dealing with here. We don't need to use something like platinum because um, aluminium won't react with the carbon anyway. Okay, so of course this solution, I say solution, remember it's not dissolved in water is your Al2O3, or aluminium oxide, which is dissolved in cryolite. Dissolved in cryolite. Okay, so this is obviously happening at 850-ish degrees, so that we have melted the cryolite. So it's molten cryolite. Okay, and what's gonna happen? Well, this here is the negative electrode, this lining here. And at the negative electrode, remember we produce aluminium metal. And so what we are going to get is aluminium metal, molten aluminium metal, forming at the bottom, okay? And what are we going to get at the positive electrode? Well, we are going to get oxygen. Remember we said the oxygen gas is going to be given off? At the positive electrodes, this is exactly what we see. So we get oxygen gas and we get molten aluminium. So this is molten aluminium. And you can see this gap here. This means that we can tap it, uh, we can tap it off if you like. That just means that we can collect it because it's at the bottom and it's separate from the solution and it's separate from anything else. We can just literally take it out of the solution. So this is gonna go out here, we collect it, and then of course we can cool it down, turn it into solid aluminium, and then we use it for all the nice um, can, tin cans and tin foil and everything that we use it for. And how about the oxygen? Well, there are obvious uses of oxygen, we use it for oxygen tanks and things like that, but very important here is that the oxygen, oxygen gas produced, as this is happening at a very high temperature, this can actually react with carbon, because the electrodes are made of carbon. And therefore, we will get carbon dioxide. 
This is not as useful, and it also means that this is going to start burning away. This is going to start breaking down. So if our oxygen is reacting with the carbon, that means that there is less carbon in the electrode, and so on, like that. Okay. That means that we need to uh, replace these as they are being broken down. So the carbon electrodes will not last forever. Because they are being turned into some carbon dioxide, we need to replace them, and that obviously increases the costs as well. And lastly, we're going to look at something known as electroplating. What this is, is plating one metal with another metal, and we do this via electrolysis. Well, I say that, there are very special cases where we can actually plate plastics now. And so, what's the point in electroplating a metal? Well, obviously, first off, in jewellery, it just makes things look nicer. So you've probably seen gold plated. So you've seen gold plating, um, silver plating. Oh, that's awful handwriting. Silver plating, etc. That is actually uh, an example of electroplating. That's where we've put a precious metal on the top of something which probably isn't so precious, such as stainless steel or something like that. And so this is a way of making things look more valuable, look more precious, and, and just uh, they're nicer like that. Uh, something which you may think is more important is it can protect the metal. So if we plate a metal which can easily be corroded, or it's very reactive, so it'll easily react with things around it. If we plate it with a metal that's not reactive, then none of the metal underneath can react with anything because it's been covered up. And so it's almost like putting a cover on something. So it protects the metal from either reacting or even a soft metal from scratching. And so um, that is another useful uh, form of electroplating. It's another reason we do it. And so how is this done? Well, what we do is we take the metal which we want to cover up with another metal. And this metal will be your negative electrode. So negative electrode is metal being plated. So this is awful handwriting, I'll neaten this up. The metal which is being plated is your negative electrode. So that means your positive electrode, positive electrode is your plating metal. So this is the metal that you're going to plate the other metal with. So what's going to be on the outside? So your plating metal. And an example that you may have been given is below. So on the left hand side we have our positive and on our right hand side we have our negative. Okay, and this is copper in this case. So copper on the right and on the left hand side we have nickel. Okay, nickel. So what we want to do is we want to cover copper up with nickel. You might have done an experiment where we cover the copper with wax and we actually scratch a design onto it. And that's quite a cool way of seeing uh, that only that part is going to be plated. But I'm just going to do the basic where we're covering the whole thing. So what is actually happening is, of course, these are joined up um, in the usual way in an electrolysis, like so. And our solution is going to contain nickel ions. So this is very important. Your solution is going to contain ions of your plating metal. So this is your metal, and in here you're going to contain nickel ions, and these are going to be positive, either one plus or two plus or, or whatever they're gonna be. Okay, so what's going to happen at the positive electrode is our nickel metal is going to form nickel ions because the nickel needs to go into solution to form these nickel ions. Okay, so it's gonna form these ions and obviously plus electrons. And in this case, it's going to be two electrons. So we formed our nickel ions. Remember, nickel is solid and nickel ions are in solution, so they are aqueous. Perfect, now at the negative electron, uh, electrode, sorry, we are going to form nickel metal again. So we're going to go from our nickel ions to nickel metal. Aqueous 
aqueous. And the way we do that is we add our electrons. So electrons, like that. And so all we're doing is we're going from solid to ions, and then the ions will then go to solid here. So we produce nickel ions, and this is the negative electrode, so these are attracted to the negative electrode, where they will form nickel metal. So they've gone from nickel to positive, and then the positive ions will reform your nickel metal. And so this is going to be plated with your solid nickel. It's not molten in this case, because remember we haven't had to melt anything down. This is happening in solution. Perfect, so nickel, metal, here. Okay, and so that is the basis of electroplating. We take our metal, which we're going to plate, and that is going to be our negative electrode. The metal we're going to plate it with is our positive electrode, and that metal, so the positive electrode, we also use those metal ions in solution. So that means that we can set up this system where we go from metal to solution to placing the other metal. Now there are many other metals obviously you can use. Um, we've spoke about gold plating, silver plating. Um, we can also, I mentioned that we can cover plastics. And the way that we do that is actually we coat plastics in tiny little particles of graphite, which is of course carbon. And then that can be plated because that does conduct electricity, as you've seen before. So there are different ways that we can do this process, um, but it's very useful for various reasons. And I'm going to stop there. Those are the three examples that you really need to know. But if you've got any questions, then please do send me an email uh, using the link below. Or you can put a comment in the comment box below and I'll be sure to get back to you. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.